Hello all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. My name is Ratish, and I would be the moderator for today's exciting event. Uh, I would like to thank you all for taking out the time uh, to attend the EdTech Power Hour session hosted by Harbinger. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Power Hour is a series of interactive roundtable discussions amongst industry stalwarts where we aim to share ideas, experiences, and insights on a particular topic. So the topic for today's discussion would be, will enhancing learning experience result in better learning outcomes? And before we begin, let us take a look at a short video with some housekeeping tips. Welcome to Harbinger's flagship interactive webinar, Power Hour. Ensure you have selected the right speaker for audio output. Test your speaker to ensure it is working fine from the audio settings option on the lower left corner of your screen. If necessary, dial in using phone. Let's tune in. With that, uh, now it's time for the introduction. Uh, our host for today's uh, roundtable discussion is Rahul Singh. Uh, Rahul is a digital learning enthusiast uh, and is passionate about helping organizations and leaders solve challenges around learner engagement and student outcomes through the intervention of learning technologies. In a career span of 15 years in the digital learning space, he has helped a host of global organizations and educational institutions in implementing new initiatives around their digital learning strategy. We welcome you, Rahul, and over to you. Thank you, Ratish. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time out to join this discussion. And uh, uh, we want this to be an interactive discussion. So at any point of time, if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat box or the Q&A section. So this this primarily a 60 minutes discussion at the end of it, last 10 to 15 minutes, we'll try and keep it reserved for the Q&A session. And uh, <clears throat> without much delay, let me kind of move ahead in the discussion. And uh, let, let me, uh, you know, take the pleasure of inviting our first panelist for the today. Uh, good morning, Nikki. Hi there, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, interesting conversation. Nikki, please, would you be able to share a little bit about yourself and about your organization, what you do, and you know, what are your typical interest areas when it comes to you know, learning experiences or learning outcomes? Sure. Um, I am the Director of Content and Communications at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. So that's a center at Yale University. It's part of the School of Medicine Child Study Center. What we do at the center is uh, we basically support schools and school districts of all sorts um, nationally in the United States, as well as internationally on uh, training the students and the adults in their lives. So the teachers and leaders in the school, as well as the parents and caregivers on emotional intelligence, basically how to be smart about our feelings. I've been at the center for uh, almost 21 years. I'll be coming up on my 21st anniversary in June. And uh, my role there has been many because I've been there for over two decades, but in the last uh, five to 10 years, I've really focused on um, the best ways to bring the emotional intelligence information and knowledge to schools and districts um, using technology. So we, we do training in person as well. And um, in the last several years, we've worked to offer some different options through online platforms um, and other digital forms. So I'm happy to be here today and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Nikki, for that wonderful introduction. So first of all, uh, congratulations on your upcoming 21st work anniversary. I mean, uh, that that's that's two decades more than two decades that's amazing Nikki congratulations thank and, you uh, I think uh, hopefully we'll get some time during this conversation and I would like to pick on a specific uh, point that you said in your introduction how do we smart about our feelings 
So, you know, maybe let's see if we can, you know, touch upon that topic in today's conversation. Sure. Right. Yeah. So thank you again. And uh, moving ahead, uh, uh, let me invite Sebert uh, as our second esteemed panelist for today. Good morning, Sebert. Thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation. Good morning, Earl, and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome. So, Sebert, if you could please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your interest areas, uh, what you do at Yale uh, Center for Emotional Intelligence, uh, you know, so that the audience can know you better. Sure, certainly. So, overall, now I've been over with technology for uh, over 20 something years, I'm about 30 years actually, from uh, technology professional role, from um, you know, technology projects management and solution, uh, integration of technology. Um, educational assessments, system administration, and so forth. And um, um, it's, I've been at Yale now a little bit over a year, actually a year and six months, and work with Nikki in the, you know, a center. And um, so my prime, one of my primary primary role is to make sure that all the technology that we use, that they are, you know, seamless to the use as much as possible. And um, that uh, can be a little bit challenging you know, in terms of when you're talking about seamless, but um, you want to, when you're using technology for online anything, you want it to be as, you know, basically invisible to the user, even though they, you know, they're using it. And so we can talk more about that later on, but for the most part, we want, you know, my role is to make sure all of our technology works smoothly and invisible as possible to the, our users. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebert. And yeah, technology working as smoothly as possible and being invisible. I mean, that's definitely on the top of the wish list. And 30 years in the technology space, and most of this has been in the higher education domain, or it's a combination? Com combination, but if, um, roughly four, year, uh, four universities and colleges um, um, back and forth. Um, and uh, actually started as a system builder and then in, uh, um, system administrator. Um, then turn into an assessment. Um, I also have a so uh, my background include computer science and um, and educational technology. And figure you know what? Let me kind of merge the two together to get the best of both worlds. And because I have, you know I, I guess one of my interests is that especially from an adult learner's point of view, I'm always interested to see how our seniors use technology and. Uh, their reaction to when something new comes out and it, it's um, not as intuitive of it as it's supposed to be, their reaction, uh, whether it's a positive one or a negative one, or will they be more engaging or tend not to use technology? These are the type of stuff that I've been um, looking at and exploring and um, over the years, and it's always interesting. And, uh, and I know we didn't get into this, but I'm going to give you a quick um, um, idea. And so I remember some years ago, um, I'm not going to say what my what, what year and uh, what university, but I remember we were talking about you know, inter, um, getting everyone to use technology. And I remember one faculty member literally break down and says, listen, I can't do this. I can't use technology every day, you know, and to get her to relax, I said, listen, don't worry about it. I will you know, I'm here, I'm gonna, you know, anything that you need, I will spend the time with you, sit down with you and walk you through it. And I will have to tell you this, that makes a whole heap of difference. Right. Because now I had, instead of somebody who were afraid, they now say, you know what, I have somebody to support me and I'm okay with that. That can, And I can work with that. You know, anyway, I think I've kind of jumped ahead, but um, sorry for that, go ahead. No, no, not at all. And in fact, uh, that's an interesting aspect because we are going to touch upon those points today. And of course, I think, uh, uh, you know, 30 years in the technology space and you might have seen some tectonic shifts. And of course, we'll touch upon some of those points. So once again, Nikki, Sibir, thank you so very much for joining us for this discussion today. So what's our game plan for today? What are we going to talk about? So basically, we'll start with... Uh, I think there's not much to talk about the need for enhancing learning experiences. Uh, everyone believes in it, but just for the, you know, setting the context purposes, we'll touch upon that particular point. The second is we we'll look at some of the key components that constitute learning experiences. And then uh, we'll, we'll touch upon technology as an enabler for enhancing learning experiences. 
And at the end of it, we'll try and answer the question that how does or does learning experiences impact learning outcomes? Improving learning experiences, does it impact learning outcomes? So that's more or less our game plan for today. Right, so the need for enhancing learning experiences. And, and today we are you know, primarily focusing on the adult learners, adult education, higher education, and you know, workforce development. So as we all know, uh, the amount of digital transformation that has been happening in the higher education space for the recent past, I think uh, you know, it's, it's fair to say that COVID triggered it to a great extent, but it was anyways coming. COVID or no COVID, the digital transformation was coming. And, you know, so, so this tremendous pace at which this digital transformation is happening. And what it is doing is there's this hybrid and distributed learning environments. So, you know, it's, it's not as simple as that you enroll for a college, uh, you walk into the campus, you sit into a lecture, or the other option is you enroll for a college which has an online program and you do it online. So it's, it's getting mixed, it's getting blended, it's getting hybrid. And what it basically is doing is, it's has kind of disrupted the status quo. And eventually this disruption is also ca causing some impact on the learning outcomes. Well, there could be multiple factors, but you know, if I had to kind of uh, call out the top three, I would say technology acceptance, both in terms of, uh, you know, the teachers, uh, faculties, and the students, then the cognitive engagement. There's so much technology overload, or there's so many applications or platforms to worry about and work about. So that cognitive overload, and then there's emotional challenges. For example, when you're in a, you know, you've been used to doing things in a face-to-face, in-person environment, but suddenly if you have to do in a virtual environment or a hybrid environment, that, that needs a different kind of uh, mentality and sometimes you're you know alone in that space. So that's where it comes in handy. And then uh, <clears throat> moving ahead, these are some of the key components that consider learning experience. And of course, uh, these are not the final ones. Uh, there could be multiple options, but you know, uh, to drive this discussion ahead, we picked up the, first, uh, the five most relevant ones which we felt. And in fact, it starts with the relevance. So the first learning experience is relevance. Uh, and just to give an idea as to what relevance means is, you know, uh, let's say there is a workforce development program or a certification program. And let's say it's in the nursing education space. So whether that particular certification program is relevant to a particular individual, that question needs to be addressed. And how can we address that question? We'll look, we'll look at that in a, you know, further in our discussion. Then personalization, I think this is pretty straightforward. You know, one size doesn't fit all. And you know, this talk about hyper-personalized learning and recommending the you know, right learning pathways or career pathways to individuals. Then third is when it comes to adult learners, flexibility is big, right? Because these adult learners, could be either, you know, college students who are preparing or getting ready for jobs or getting into the job market, or these could also be learners who have been in the who have been in jobs, but then they're coming back to learning to just to either you know uh, for, for the economic mobility, mobility, let's say to get a better job or to get a get a better payouts and those kind of things. So flexibility is definitely has to be there because learning is not the only focus area that they have currently at that point of time in their career or life. And a third one is engagement that kind of goes across the board that engagement is pretty important. And especially when you have hybrid learning environments or self-paced learning environments, you, keep, you need to keep the learner engaged and a continuous support system, whether that support system comes through, you know, your peers, your faculties, uh, you know, or through some uh, technology enabled solution. And we'll look at that, you know, uh, later in, 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 in the call with us. So, yeah, so at this stage, uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to, uh, you know, invite Nikki and uh, request her to share her thoughts in terms of uh, 
what do you feel about these uh, five components of learning experience as, and if you want to kind of add or you know comment on some of this Sure. I think it might be helpful to give a little bit of context, a little more context. And I think you made this point, Raul, a little earlier about what we do at the center. Um, I mentioned that we um, help adults and students on sort of how to be smart about feelings. So I'll say just a bit more about that just to give context. So basically, we have an acronym that's also the name of our program. It's it's RULER, R-U-L-E-R. And the acronym recommend, or represents um, five skills of emotional intelligence. And it's recognizing emotions. So really um, in ourselves and others, so in our face and our body and our voice and our actions, um, understanding emotions. So why do we feel the way we do? Labeling emotions. So what is the exact word to describe how I'm, I'm feeling? Am I angry or am I frustrated? Am I anxious or am I stressed? Because when we have the right vocabulary, then we can really think about what we want to do with that emotion and what we need. So expressing and uh, regulating are the last two skills. And those are really about how we show up in the world, given what we are feeling. And if we're feeling anxious or if we're feeling frustrated, what do we need to either stay with that feeling if it's a helpful feeling or to shift to something else if it's not serving us in the moment? And so just to say that is a very um, short explanation of the work we do, but those are the skills that Ruler, um, our programming at the Center for Emotional Intelligence, is designed to teach in students and all the adults in their lives. What we do at the Center or how we teach those skills is we have um, in-person trainings as well as online platforms that reach the staff in the schools and in the districts. And so the users of our um, technology are school teachers and school leaders, as well as some district level administrators um, in school districts. And so I just wanted to give that background on who our users are, who our audience is, and what we actually are teaching. And we have a bunch of things for the staff, and we have a bunch of things like classroom curricula for the students. All of that to say, we only had our in-person offering for many, many years, most of the years that I've been at the center. And we decided, um, and this aligns with the, the previous slide in terms of the, the hybrid experience becoming more popular, we decided around 2014, 2015, that we need to also offer digital supports. And so we had a hybrid version and in-person training and then additional supports offered online that we launched around 2016, 2017. And then we decided, you know, maybe we want to also offer our training online as an option, not to require people to, to do it online, but sort of as an equitable solution so that if people couldn't come to Yale University or we couldn't come to them, then they could enroll in an online version of our training. So we actually piloted that in uh, 2019 serendipitously and fortunately right before the pandemic we had this option in place and so we went to fully online um, in 2020 and we remained fully online until um, through this year actually we're going to go back to offering um, our in-person mm -hmm. training again this fall so um, it, but actually we're going to keep offering the online supports as well and sort of test things out and and see if we want to go back to hybrid or if we want to offer um, both. So all of that to say, I wanted to give you the context. Um, all of these things are things that we consider as we have developed the original versions of our online platforms and digital tools and all of the pieces. And these are things that we pay attention to as we are evaluating the effectiveness, as we are thinking about, are we really reaching the audiences? Are we creating that seamless learning experience that Siebert says he's focused on for so many years. So all of these things really come together in the way that we develop, evaluate, and improve all of our systems at the Center for Emotional Intelligence. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, that's uh, that's interesting. And thank you very much for giving that detailed context. Uh, pretty interesting stuff that uh, you and your uh, organization is doing. So evaluating the effectiveness uh, is, is definitely one key uh, step in the entire process because we can you know keep going in a direction and we can say that you know these are the five components that we believe will you know improve the learning experiences or enhance the learning experiences but there has to be an evaluation step and i think uh, we'll we'll come back to this point later towards the end of our discussion 
And uh, uh, Sebert, any, any thoughts and comments on these uh, five components? Well, plenty in intellectual uh, because again, in, in when you're doing an, anything online, um, it, you know, the, the technology that you use have to be relevant. Um, you know, of course, for example, one of, the, one of the thing that pretty much any website or online institution does it, they, they, are, they offer technology, but uh, most of the time they don't generally say, you know what, gee, how is it affecting all of my users? Um, all of my users, do they um, have um, internet access or what have you? Are the right you know, type of internet access? For example, if you're doing all, um, say, virtual uh, VR um, or immersive um, learning, um, do you consider who may have access to, who may not have access, who you may be eliminated and not eliminated um, from the, um, do you consider um, providing um, those who are less fortunate some kind of assistance or um, uh, is your um, your technology, is it um, optimized for the the lowest um, kind of common denominator in terms of you know, those who may not have, you know, fast internet access or whatever, that kind of stuff. And so you, you know, and also, if you're thinking about, you know, well, from a support point of view, but also from the person who is designing the technology, they have to take all of these into consideration. Um, uh, the, the the how it's being presented is is it relevant to all of my 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 user base and that kind of stuff? Um, is the in terms of how the tech devices that they're going to use flexibly from tablet to phone, computer, what have you, different type of operating system, different type of web browser. These are all type of things that going on into the learning experience and stuff that um, the user is going to experience, you know, whether it's good or bad um, in between. Um, and also, now, in terms of, in our case, we have a uh, um, support folks um, in terms of if something is happening, we have an easy way that our users can reach us. And we have a you know, uh, timeline in terms of when we get back to them. And that makes the difference because, yeah, you can have the technology and if it's not being supported right, or you, you can, your users have no way of reaching out to say, listen, something is going on. Um, can you um, look at it and get back to me in a timely fashion? These are all um, things that affect how the program that you have in online operates, um, um, get use or spread or whatever you. Um, so the issue of well, relevance, yeah, the technology is irrelevant, is the, the, the user base and, and the content that you're, um, that you're presenting is relevant to the learning. Of course, in our case though, um, we are specific in what we're doing. So we know um, our user base, uh, we get feedback from them all the time to see what's going on, how, what, how can we improve our, what we're doing. Um, and of course, we know it's engaging, you know, because of you know the fact that our program is pretty much popular and and on and, and the outcome in terms of our assessment. And um, of course, we try, you know, we we make it flexible in terms of not just one person doing the presentation. We have multiple um, um, what you would call instructor, but we call them the facilitators um, presenting our technology to a different um, audience and people. So that makes, you know, that's kind of giving the idea of customizing to the user, to the user base and so forth. And so, and again, you try to be as engaging as you possibly can, but uh, again, it depends on your user, but yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. So moving ahead uh, in the discussion, I think uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll take a quick audience poll and uh, I'll just launch the poll. It will show up on your screen. So I will request the, audience to you know uh, add their views to this so yeah i've launched the poll it should be up on your screens now primarily the question is in your point of view which of the following are the key components that constitute a learning experience and this you can select multiple options so yeah i see some uh, responses coming in thank you very much uh, for the active participation we will probably keep this open for another 20 seconds or so, and then we'll kind of look at the results. Right, so almost 80% of the audience has kind of voted. So probably a good time to uh, end the poll and uh, see the results, so. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for actively participating in this. So I'll just uh, 
load the results. All right, I hope you can uh, see the results at your end. And uh, I see there's a smile on Nikki's face, probably uh, some of the areas which Nikki believes strongly in is uh, the top contenders. So uh, engagement, 87% is an outright winner, followed closely by relevance. Uh, these are big indicators for us and, and thank you. So engagement and relevance, and of course, personalization, flexibility and support are right up there uh, you know, at the third position, joint third position. Okay, so now we'll move ahead in our conversation. And what we will do is basically, we will pick up one of the each components and I will share an example or a use case where technology can come in as an enabler for enhancing learning experiences. And then I'll invite alternatively Nikki and Seba to comment on this particular aspect and share any of their experiences or thoughts that they might have. So in terms of relevance, uh, you know, we, and, and remember we are talking about the adult learners here. So we are living in a skills economy today and a granular component of the skills economy is competencies because stats eventually takes you from point A to point B in your you know, uh, professional life and your jobs and uh, all those things. So if there could be a system and it's, this competency-based learning framework is very simple. It's not very complicated. Uh, it can, you know, as a starting point, it can be started uh, at an excellence level and at the highest end, it can be used uh, by implementing uh, an AI-enabled uh, ecosystem or a natural language processing ecosystem. So if there was a system through which, or if there was a methodology through which we could identify uh, the competency gaps in a particular individual, and then recommend them some key learning pathways to improve on those competency gaps so that they can do better in their jobs in their lives and you know economic mobility get a better job and all those kind of things so that's kind of the relevance part and the competency based learning framework so but uh, you know and and just over a minute or so if you could please share your thoughts on this particular aspect from a, um a, again from an adult learner's point of view in a case like this in terms of competency one you would have some um curriculum in place for example um, curriculum in place for example but you also may do an assessment to see where the learner um, you know, are in their, in their current level of whatever the content that you're trying to present. And based on that, you can tailor your, um, the training to that. It, again, it just depends on if you are the one who designing the content from scratch or, um, or if you know, in our case, are, you know, you know we, we, you would use a, a, a team of, of, of um, professional in terms of, you know, kind of gauge the uh, competency of what need to be presented, what learners need to know, and so forth. And so I'm thinking in that, um, hopefully based on that um, feedback, you know, for example, in your, in your learning management system, um, that could be a, a, you know, a preliminary assessment that's saying, um, that walks with them, walk them through what we think they should know, what they, don't know and how we need to adjust our curriculum to ad, um, adjust where they are. Right. Now, thank you, Sibir. That That's a great point, uh, prelim assessment. And I think uh, the learners should be aware as to what they don't know. That That's a key step in that entire process. So thank you for sharing your comments on this. Uh, we'll move to the next one, uh, personalization. And this is an absolute personal favorite for me. So. Basically, you know, the use case that I'm going to talk about is technology for technology as an enabler is, uh, you know, the AI enabled recommendation engines, for example, and I think we can connect the dots. Let's say that the competency based framework is able to identify the certain competency gaps, and then they're also able to identify the learning resources or learning pathways then how can AI come into picture or artificial intelligence, how can they come into picture to a certain extent wherein, and there could be multiple scenarios. One scenario is the AI could come into picture and say that, you know, 
your organization has access to LinkedIn Learning, Udemy. There's this open educational resources on YouTube. There are these blogs. There's this internal documentation. But to fill in your competency gaps, I have curated content from all these different sources. And I have put together in a format which is easy for you to consume. So this is my recommendation to you that you go through this learning pathway. So that's, that's one use case where we could use an AI-enabled recommendation engine. The second use case could be is, let's say, if an individual is, you know, kind of trying to skill, upskill, or reskill themselves on a particular skill set or technology, and they are not aware in terms of what is best for them. So what if, if you know, there is a system, you know, an AI-enabled system, which kind of captures the demographic data of that individual for example, which area do they stay in? What are their aspirations? What was their last job? How much were they earning previously? And uh, you know, what are their current skills? And then where are they actually looking to do a job? Are they looking to do a job in the same city or they are open to move to a different city? And then that on the other hand of the uh, ecosystem, there are these job boards which reflect that, okay, these are the industry areas or specific skill sets, which are the most highest paying jobs in your particular city or area or the area in which you're looking for a job. And then they make those recommendations. So they connect those dots, availability of jobs and the aspiration of the individual and where they currently stand and belong and artificial intelligence uh, makes those recommendations. So the, the variety of AI enabled recommendation engines, there's just a couple of use cases that I share. And I'll, I'll just take a pause here. And Nikki, I'll uh, invite you to please share your uh, comments and thoughts on this entire personalization uh, for learning experiences. Sure. I'll just say at first glance, I had a hard time um, differentiating between um, relevance and personalization. And then I realized that um, just to go back quickly before I go into personalization um, to relevance, Actually, that was the most important thing for us to consider because we're teaching about emotional skills, which also involves social interactions and looking at people's faces and listening to their voices and interacting with one another. So we really thought about relevance before we engage in any of our technology because we said, can we teach emotional intelligence? Can we teach all these skills about our feelings? virtually. And so just to say that was really important for us. And um, when I think about personalization, differentiating it from kind of the relevance of the content to the learners, and this really focusing on audience, the way that we look at this is we have, um, I mentioned leaders of districts, leaders of schools, we have um, teachers of different grade levels, and um, they have students with different needs. So we can really tailor their learning pathways to um, their roles in the school or in the district and um, base their learning on what they need based on their role. So that's how we really focus on personalization. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And uh, absolutely, I totally agree with you in terms of uh, both the aspects. One is that, you know, there's a definite overlap between relevance and personalization. You know, it will be fair to club them together at one point of time. But yeah, it's it's basically relevance is, uh, is, is what's the most relevant thing in this entire conversation, because it's that's the starting point and it starts from there. So you mentioned about, you know, for school districts, you kind of uh, curate the learning pathways or uh, create custom learning pathways for individuals based on their job roles and, 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 and those kind of things. So uh, do you have kind of an evaluation mechanism or do you plan to have an evaluation mechanism through which you can assess the effectiveness of those uh, uh, you know, curated pathways, because I'll, I'll kind of connect the dots when we go back to the competency based learning framework, it starts from identifying the competency gaps, you know, provide them the curated learning pathways, provide them continuous support through their entire learning journey process. And once they have completed their learning journey, then we again do the mapping with their competencies and, 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 and try to identify whether the gaps have been uh, wherever there were gaps, were, have they improved or not, or has the needle moved or not? So any thoughts on that? 
That's a great question. We actually just really started identifying tech solutions for creating those um, individualized learner pathways. The way that we had done it in our previous platforms is um, it's just a searchable resource library, or they can look for, say that it's a fifth grade teacher, they can look for the fifth grade curriculum. Um, but the way that we are hoping to do it, and hopefully we will have a way to assess its effectiveness, is to create these individualized um, learner pathways. We do a little bit of it in terms of reporting. For instance, district leaders see a different type of report for their district, the school leaders see reporting on their schools, and the teachers see reporting just on their classrooms. But um, we're going to be doing a lot more of this over time, and um, we'll be evaluating and monitoring its effectiveness and, and enhancing it over time as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, I think... Uh, and, and I think a lot of organizations and uh, leaders uh, who are working in this domain of helping people scale, reskill, upscale are looking into this direction in terms of how to capture the right set of data points so that we can have an effective evaluation process in place. And that's where, uh, you know, probably, of course, uh, you know, with the help of uh, human creativity, artificial intelligence can make sense because what it can do basically is it can take a lot of data, synthesize it and make sense out of their data and give, you know, recommendable, actionable points out of it. Right, so, okay, we have spent enough time on personalization. We'll move ahead uh, to the next one. So flexibility. Uh, this is a close... Uh, second position in terms of my personal favorite because because primarily of uh, you know i think with every individual these days uh, uh, for adult learners uh, life is not as straightforward as that right because when you're a student uh, i remember when i was in campus it would be either about studying sports or you know some extracurricular activities or hanging out with friends so you kind of have control on your life but when you move into an you know, adults, and if you probably have a family, you get married, you have a job, and, you know, you have so many different other responsibilities, you have social obligations and all those kind of things, this very limited time left uh, to, you know, do a formal learning. And that's where flexibility comes into picture. And uh, one of the examples of technology as an enabler for enhancing uh, learning experiences, specifically on the flexibility part, is the nudge learning framework. I think uh, there's a lot that has been spoken about nudge in the last five years. Uh, I think if I recall correctly, 2017 was the year when Richard Taylor won the Nobel Prize for his work and research on nudge. And, you know, you would be uh, surprised to know that nudge has been there forever. In fact, uh, you know, almost as early as, you know, a couple of centuries back, or at least in 1800 century, nudge was there. In fact, in some of the countries, there was a specific ministry of nudge. And, and in, in one of the Western countries, nudge was used to motivate people to pay taxes on time because nudge is basically tied back to the behavioral science theory. So if you want to bring in a behavioral change, you would probably nudge someone in a timely manner, in a spaced manner. It also kind of talks about the Evingos forgetting curve. So whatever you learn in uh, in a classroom environment or an online environment, 60% of that is lost in the first hour. And then there's also a principle of least coercion on which the nudge learning framework works. Because you can keep pushing learning content towards adult learners, but if they are not engaged, if it's not relevant, if it's not personalized, and if they are not motivated enough to consume that content, you're just pushing content. There's nothing happening with that content. And this nudge learning framework, it, it basically works on a concept called EAST, which is easy. It has to be really super easy to implement. Google implemented it via email. No technology, plain and simple emails. Attractive. It should be something attractive, engaging for the learner. Social, so that people can connect with it. And timely. So that's where the spaced repetition comes into picture. And interestingly, there's a mathematical formula. It's a pretty complex formula, but yes, there is a formula for spaced repetition, which basically says that, you know, after how many intervals should you send out learning content or nudges to an individual to bring in that behavioral change? So there could be multiple options and uh, flexibility is one. 
So Sebat, uh, I know you were alluding to some of these points towards the flexibility part in, in the conversation earlier. So I'll request you to kind of please come in here and share your thoughts in terms of, and you have seen this across three decades. So what does flexibility means in today's context? Well, today's context flexibility is basically everything is the idea of personalizing um, how I, um, I want to do my learning. Now, that is, but for, for adult for adult learners, it's a little bit more tricky because usually when they embark on the learning experience, it's usually to improve something about it could be their salary um, in terms of getting a higher um, scale in terms of the higher degree um, to influence your paycheck. Um, or from a teacher's perspective, um, it could be um, a slightly different rank um, or, you know, it, leaving it from... Uh, um, teacher to an administration and the pay scale, you know, you, you, sometimes you can be looking at an issue of $10,000 pay difference. And so the flexibility in, a, in, in the learning is like, okay, I have to work all day. And then my, oh, how do I um, take the time to do my professional development to increase, you know, my like livelihood, my, um, my, my professionalism per, per se. And so the flexibility in terms of how you use technology to do that is one option. In, um, and of course, the, the idea is in terms of it, it all depends on the technology that you're trying, the content that you're trying to uh, consume. And so, of course, yeah, flexibility is 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 first and, uh, in, in all of that, because if it's not flexible for a person who wants to work um, all day and then have kids and what have you, the, you have to give them some way of saying, you know what, yes, we know you're working. Um, but we're going to make this the and we know you perhaps possibly can't come to us, especially if you're in another state or what have you. Make the te technology so flexible that you can learn and not in and not be endurance to whatever you're trying to learn or whatever. And so, to me, in that in that sense, um, and, and of course, um, that's one of my um, we call it um, interest in that. It, you know, I see technology that is, you know, it's supposed to be there. It's a bridge to getting where I want to go, but it's supposed to be flexible enough to, for me to get where I need to go and not in there, in there what my progress. And so it, it's in that sense. It's, um, and of course, we, we learn very fast um, in, in um, COVID um, that um, you're offering, if it's not flexible, that, in, that is online and, and, and easy for folks to get to, you have, you have, a, you have, you have a problem. You are uh, because again your your customer base they're gonna go someplace else unless the only time that does is not the case is if you're the only shop in town that have that content that they're trying to learn, and and again now in that so now the fact that we have um, even in our case you have, I'm pretty sure um, you have um, if, or if you're a university for, let's look at that from a university point of view and if you are if you if you know ten universities teaching. Um, um, Educational technology specialists. Now, the ones that have it more flexible is going to be the one that you know kind of the best, better, uh, the more the most um, students or learners, you know. And so, in that case, that will be flexibility to come in. But I'm looking at flexibility and, and personalization and relevance, and you can't really separate them. They're intertwined, very much so. Right. No, that's that's a good point. Uh, I like the way you summarized it. I think. Uh, uh, I've, I've made a note of that point, and we'll come back to that point uh, later in the conversation, uh, the inch twine uh, part. I think that's very interesting. So now we'll uh, move to the next block, and that's engagement. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's very important because uh, what's happening is, uh, you know, if you're implementing hybrid learning solutions or self-paced learning solutions, uh, people are learning remotely, or, or they are alone at times. Uh, they are in the middle of something, uh, in the flow of work, and at that point of time, they need some help and those kind of things. So uh, <clears throat> again, uh, for engagement part, there are multiple uh, different kind of examples. But uh, you know, I'll just pick up one example from a technology implementation perspective. You know, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, these hybrid campuses that we have in the higher education space these days. So uh, as a student, you are probably allowed to, you know, come to the, uh, it's, it's, it's like the hybrid working model, right? For, for uh, 
you know, the industry professionals that you can either come to the office, work from home, or, you know, kind of flexible. So if you do a Zoom meeting, there are four people sitting in a conference room, and there are 10 odd people sitting in different Zoom windows. And it's 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 suddenly different for all of us. And, and you know, how do we ensure that we have that same engagement, right? It's two different things, right? Having 20 people in Zoom meeting will have a different level of engagement. 20 people sitting in a conference room will have a different engagement. But the dynamic suddenly changes if there's four people in conference and 10 people in Zoom. So that's what happened with these campuses when they allowed this hybrid uh, learning model. And that's where uh, quite a few campuses have already implemented Metaverse and some are further thinking of implementing Metaverse. What basically it does is you can create a virtual environment for your campus. So it will actually look like that you're, you're entering into your campus. You can create your avatar, which looks as cool as you are. And then within that uh, Metaverse environment, uh, the, the professor, could, could be in the classroom and delivering a session, but a professor's avatar could be in the uh, uh, metaverse environment and your peers, your students, their avatars could also be in the metaverse environment. So even if you're not in the campus, you still have some connect. You can you know, talk to the instructor, you can interact with your uh, peer students and those kind of things. So there's just one example for, for engagement. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to Nikki. And uh, Nikki, any thoughts and comments on the engagement part specifically uh, or some of the things that you have been doing in this area? Yeah, when I think about engagement or when we think about engagement, we really think about how to get the learners in and how to keep them in. So um, there are simple things like incentivizing them with a certificate of completion to keep them there. Um, and we give them lots of reminders. Um, you have X amount of time left before you can get your certificate or you have um, you know, X number of points left in order to get your certificate. So we have things like that to um, sort of incentivize. And then one of the other ways that we really keep learners engaged is diversifying the learning experience. So um, keeping it really textured, having a variety of ways to engage the learner, discussion boards so that they can talk to other learners, reflections so that they can reflect privately, uh, videos, um, we actually do a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning. So we have Zoom meetings that they can interact with experts. Um, so that's really how we keep people engaged the best that we can. Uh, thank you, Nikki. This is very interesting. I think uh, the uh, diversifying of learning experiences part that you spoke about, that's, that's very interesting. And I think it will be very re relevant for our audience to understand that you know <clears throat> the times that we are currently living in of course, uh, digitization is a need of the hour. Implementing uh, uh, technology-enabled solutions is also a need of the hour to a certain extent, as Seba said, that it's a bridge. But I think at the same point of time, what we have to understand is this diversifying the learning experience is the point that specifically Nikki made that, you know, you cannot have like, you know, same looking type of e-learning courses for a three-hour, uh, you know, certification program. It, that there needs to be different components to it. And what those components are, you can pick and choose and decide that instructionally what makes the most relevant for your target audience. Some examples that Nikki gave was, you know, discussion boards and, you know, videos and experiences. There's also a lot of talk about work-based learning experiences. How can we kind of, uh, you know, bring them into picture? And uh, when you spoke about, uh, you know, incentivizing the students or the learners by giving them certificates and all, I would, you know, probably just add one point here is that, you know, implementing micro-credentialing at this stage for the engagement part and incentivizing the students and the learners part could be a, a good move. And, and it's helpful for, for, for the entire community. Basically, what it does is it starts with the learner individual, that they feel motivated and they feel proud that, okay, they have earned a badge on a particular skill or a competency. The employer exactly knows that, okay, this particular individual has uh, skills or qualifications or competencies in this particular area. And tomorrow, if that person needs to move out of the particular organization and look for a new job, these digital credentials will help the help make the connections between the employer and the employee. 
So uh, I think that's that's a big trend coming in uh, you know, in your part of the world, Nikki, in the US. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about it. And in fact, uh, globally as well, I would say globally, uh, this uh, movement happening there. So probably in the next one year or so, we'll see a lot of buzz around this. Right, so, all right. So we'll, we'll kind of, uh, in the next two to three minutes, we'll quickly wrap up this discussion and then we'll open up for the Q&A. So this this the last one. This is kind of providing the support for the learner, and uh, one of the um, technology as an enabler for enhancing learning experiences is that you know, what if if there could be an AI driven virtual coach? Uh, of course, we have been all of us have been using Siri and you know Alexa and you know a lot of other things, and of course they cannot replace human beings. I totally agree, but. Uh, you know, if there's no one to talk to you, even if your dog is not willing to talk to you, you'll probably end up talking to Alexa or Siri at times. And that, 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 that's, that's on the lighter side. But yeah, uh, you know, when your faculty is not there, when you cannot reach out to your peers or it's 2 a.m. in the morning and you're looking for something, you can turn to these solutions. So these are stopgap arrangements. I'll just tell you a quick story that might be interesting and probably you might have heard of it. When COVID hit, Georgia Tech University implemented an AI-based teaching assistant. And they actually christened it and called it Simon, I guess. And the entire semester ended. And at the end of the semester, the students got to know that the Simon with whom they were interacting online and virtually, Simon was not an actual human being. It was an AI-enabled bot. And, 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 and <laughs> so that was the interesting part, but we have moved on from that particular stage. So yeah, uh, so yeah, moving ahead, I think uh, the last uh, uh, point of view that I want from Nikki and Seber is, uh, is it fair to say that enhancing learning experiences will eventually improve learning outcomes? And Nikki, you can go ahead first. Sure. I mean, I think um, it sort of seems intuitive that if we have better learning experiences, then um, there will be better learning outcomes. Uh, I know for us, just moving everything from um, non-digital to digital forced us to organize in ways that we hadn't before and forced us to really consider some of these aspects that we discussed today, like personalizing to specific audiences. When you do something in person, for instance, in our case, a training, you're speaking to the whole group at once. So you don't have the opportunity to individualize, to personalize the learning, to meet people where they are, That the same opportunity that you do when you start to work in these digital spaces. So I think that there's a lot of potential for technology to serve us in these ways. And um, I think it's untapped. And we were actually pleasantly surprised that we can teach emotional intelligence through technology. So I think that there are a lot of cases where we wouldn't assume that technology would, would be a way to enhance learning outcomes when it actually can be. Okay. Right. Another interesting thing about technology is this. It's, uh, it's continually changing. Moore's law uh, is the one uh, case. But here's the thing. What, no matter what you, we do, technology will change. And it, the question is, how do we look at that, or look at the emerging technology that's coming out and kind of plan for it and take into consideration how am I gonna how am I gonna modify my current offering so that it actually improve improve the learning experience? I mean, prior to COVID, um, it, it, it was optional in a lot of things. COVID forced us, especially when you couldn't go anywhere. For example, takes stuff like um, during COVID, movies, theater, places like those work are closed. And with what people did, uh, you know, Netflix um, experience um, um, share went up because. People were just using more of that. You know, you're still being entertained. And then new edition, uh, there was a there was a case where you have um, people who are living different, all over the world and they combine a musical piece. And uh, how they did it is amazing because you have, you know, the fact that you have them in different location and they, you know, splice that technology so that each person 
did what they have to do and, and let it work seamlessly, even though we know in our mind that they are miles and miles away, but it worked, you know. And so we're looking at um, what we do. How can it, and, and, and that's that another big thing for me is the issue of continuous improvement. And the idea of learning, the learning theories, or even con connectivityism, they talk to you about the fact that we learn together, um, we, we pick a little bit from everybody that we come in contact with, whether it's other students, our teacher, a movie we watch, uh, um, or what have you. We take a little bit of all of that and we make it our own and we improve ourselves. And, and that's technology. We, we're going to draw on technolo technology more now than ever before. As a matter of fact, I dare you this. Shut off your technology for a week. <laughs> See what happens. Right. No, See thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you so much, uh, Nikki Sibert, uh, for this wonderful discussion. I think uh, we had a wonderful time. I'm sure the audience would have had a wonderful time. And uh, with that, uh, Ratish, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, thank you, Sebert. I think, uh, you know, uh, we've, uh, we basically, you know, uh, the session is, uh, has been so interesting uh, that, you know, we would possibly uh, going back uh, with some food for thought today. But, um, you know, I'll just take this opportunity to kind of just, uh, you know, uh, walk through what Harbinger does. And uh, uh, as an organization founded in 1990, over three decades of experience uh, with uh, just over about 850 plus employees, uh, you know, we work with HR tech, uh, ed tech, and uh, with health tech uh, industry. So if we talk about the industries in the right, uh, you know, health, e-learning, digital publishing, um, are the organizations that we work with. And uh, all in all, uh, till date, we've done, uh, you know, uh, more than 500 plus uh, products that we've developed. We've, we have 400 plus customers. And one of the important aspects that, uh, you know, Harbinger always believes in as an organization is, uh, you know, uh, in diversity, uh, equity, and inclusivity. And that basically comes up on these numbers where we have 43% plus uh, as a woman workforce and 40% of the top uh, executive team consists of women. So with that, uh, you know, I would like to open up uh, uh, for questions. Uh, we only have about a couple of minutes left. Uh, so we'll possibly take a couple of questions. Uh, please feel free to type in your question in the chat uh, or the Q&A panel, and I would be happy to bring them up for our panelists. And uh, Nikki and Sibir, if you want to drop your email addresses in the chat box, uh, please feel free to do so. If anyone wants to reach out to you to get a question clarified, or else if the questions come to us, we will kind of uh, reroute uh, them to you uh, later on as well. So either way, so, you know, whatever works best for you. Yeah, keeping... Great. Sorry. Yeah, so keeping the time aspect in mind, uh, you know, I would just like to conclude uh, if if that's okay with uh, Rahul, uh, Nikki, yeah. and Sabat. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rahul and Nikki and Sabat for the wonderful discussion. You know, I have basically taken a lot of notes in terms of uh, relevance, uh, engagement, you know, diversifying learning components, building engagement, uh, to you know, kind of enhance uh, the learning experience that a user gets, and I'm sure the audience must have also done the same. Um, so thank you again, um, and uh, you know, I would also like to thank our viewers for joining the session through Zoom as well as LinkedIn, and you all have an amazing uh, day ahead. Thank you, and have a great day. <laughs>